good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to the Climate Change Disability and Rehabilitation Workshop. We are so excited to have you here today. My name is Cecilia Sorensen, and I am the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, which is based at Columbia University. This workshop is brought to you uh, by a tremendous collaboration between the Global Consortium, Sustain Our Abilities, and the International Society of, Physi of Physical and Rehabilitation Medicine. I'd like to welcome my, my co-partner here, uh, Mark Lee Alexander from Sustain Our Abilities. Mark Lee, are you there? Yes, I'm here, and I'm just going to uh, stay, say hi for a moment. I am actually of all things in the uh, middle of what is now tropical storm in without power and outdoors. So I apologize for any, any uh, wind sounds in the background, but I'm so happy to bring the people from Sustain Our Abilities and ISPRM together in this course. I think this is the first course that's really trying to take a comprehensive look at this topic for professionals in the field of rehabilitation. And I do want to say that we do plan in the future to have a similar course for people with the lived experience of disabilities. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. Um, she's calling in from the middle of a hurricane right now. So <laughs> we are uh, flying a little bit by the seat of our pants. Um, thank you for bearing with us. Um, but we have a tremendous uh, collection of speakers here today uh, to speak with you. So just want to give you a little bit of an overview of the workshop. We will be meeting for the next four and uh, the next three actually Thursdays at this same time. This workshop series has four sessions. We're going to be covering climate change and disability. What are the health and ability concerns? In our second session, we will be covering climate change and rehabilitation therapies. In our third session, we will be talking about responding to climate change and what it means for persons with disabilities. And in our fourth session, we will be talking about how healthcare professionals can be part of the solution. So let's kick off our first session today. Uh, really what this is, is an overview of climate change and how it affects those living with disabilities. And the goal of this discussion is to really lay the framework to understand the health impacts of climate change and to provide some perspectives on what climate change means for people living with disabilities. So we have four speakers today. Our first is Dr. Markley Alexander. She is the founder of Sustain Our Abilities and she is a physiotherapist. I will also be speaking, as I mentioned, I am the director of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education and I am an emergency medicine physician. We will also hear from Dr. Carl Luchico, who is a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist. He trained at the Philippine General Hospital and is now pursuing further studies through a clinical fellowship in brain medicine at the University of Toronto in Canada. And we will also be hearing from Dr. Maya Newman, who is a physical medicine and rehabilitation specialist and a forthcoming assistant professor in pediatric re rehabilitation medicine under the Department of Neurosurgery at the University of California. So just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Um, just so you know, all of our sessions will be recorded and they will be made available on the course website. We will put the link in the chat uh, for you to be able to find all the recordings and all the information about upcoming sessions. Just a few notes about Zoom logistics. Please put all questions for speakers in the Q&A. Um, that's where we will be able to find them the best. It says here to put them in the chat. It should say put them in the Q&A. A note to please keep your microphones muted and we invite you to have your cameras on so that you're able to uh, have bi-directional communication with us. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Markley Alexander uh, for our first talk. Thank you. Thank you, Cece. And um, before I start speaking and hopefully, um, Haley, you can switch my slides. I apologize that I am not able to do this alone today. Um, is everybody hearing me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Okay, great. Um, one thing is I am not a physical therapist. I am something called a physiatrist, which is actually a physician with expertise and specialty in physical medicine and rehabilitation. So just wanted to make that correction. It's interesting. That's not a word that's well known. Um, so 
I want to talk about climate change, disability, and rehabilitation. And really, one of the goals, one of the big goals of this workshop series is to get you all in the audience ready to act and realize that we need to act as a team to conquer climate change. Um, these are the other hats I wear. I'm the editor of in chief of the Journal of Climate Change and Health and have an academic appointment at the University of Alabama and a research um, relationship with Harvard. Um, next slide. Kelly, can you switch the slide? Are you guys having problems hearing me? Uh, no, we can I hear switched you it. Okay, perfect. So, uh, my question to you, first for people in the audience, and I'm briefly going to turn on my video and share where I am, is do you and how often do you think about climate change? And as you say this, um, we'll see if my video is working or not, um, but this is kind of the remnants and um, visuals of what um, Hurricane Ian is turning into on the other side of Florida. So if you all want to put some answers in the chat, uh, we would love to hear your thoughts. And Cece, maybe if you could read people's thoughts, if we have any responses. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to hear from everybody. You can just type your answers in the chat to the question of how often do you think about climate change? One of the things that I've noticed as I've been speaking more about this in the field of rehabilitation is many times this is the first time that people are actually making the link. People often think about disasters, but when they think about disasters, they think about earthquakes and other things like that. They don't necessarily think about the heat, the hurricanes, the floods, the wildfires. And these are all things that we've got to start attending to. So Mark Lee, we've got some, uh, some, uh, some often some answers here. People are saying yes, and very often, every day, very often. We did just realize that the chat is for some reason disabled, so we can just do all our communication through the Q&A. Uh, but it sounds like okay. people do think about it, at least on a weekly basis, pretty often. Someone says recent drought in New Jersey over the summer, but more frequently about this in the context of medicine. Um, and so lot, lots of thoughts about it. Okay, great. So let's go to the next slide. And this is the real question. We may think about it, but actually at this point, what actions have you taken to address climate change? And I would say that one of my goals here is really to ensure that we all start taking actions. And there's a number of ways you can take actions that we will go through in the course of this workshop. So everyone can put their answers to this in the Q&A box right now. So we've had a few folks put answers in. Uh, Teresa saying that they switched their health system to more environmentally friendly anesthetic gases. Uh, Claire is saying that she started to direct a curricular efforts at OSU uh, College of Medicine. David is saying local commuting via rail bicycle only, um, avoid when reasonable animal products, reducing unnecessary consumption. Amanda is saying at a family level, we travel less, eat less meat. Uh, Teresa is saying we're trying to create a clinical culture of sustainability and resource stewardship. Elena is saying, I think about climate change daily. I spread the word to make awareness. George is saying that he educates the communities about climate change. Kimberly is saying that she moved continents to take up an opportunity to focus her work on climate change. 
Gloria is reframing her research to use a planetary health lens as a means to tackle some of the issues. Wow, so those are some great responses. Um, let's go to the next slide because I, uh, it sounds like we've got a great um, start here in terms of action. And for those of you that haven't had a chance yet, um, hopefully by the end of the talk, you'll start thinking about what steps you're gonna make over the next few months. Next slide. You can go. And apologize if there's a lot of background sound. We're having some pretty big gusts now. So one of the, I'm into acronyms, I guess. And one of the things that we would like you to think about as healthcare professionals in terms of climate change is using see clear as a way to remember what we can do. And see clear stands for communicators, climate leaders, educators, advocates, and researchers. These are all things as health care professionals we are talented at just by our training and what we do in our daily life. So there's a nice editorial on this in the journal and um, would love to um, have you all take a look at it if you're interested. And maybe somebody could share a link to the journal if that's possible, Cece. Yes, um, absolutely. So Next slide. Okay, so why are we climate leaders? Well, we have power. One study showed how patients value climate change counseling provided by their pediatrician. So just virtue of the fact that we are um, professionals we have networks that we work with in our back work, in our backgrounds. We are definitely um, climate leaders and need to be so. And we can communicate with other professionals, family members, community members, students, and professionals. And if you've not taken any trainings in doing these type of actions, there's a number of organizations where you can get training, many books where you can read some of the, some of the um, more powerful books. Drawdown is a great book to read. Um, there's the Citizens Climate Lobby. There's the Climate Reality Project. There's a number of organizations where you can get some personal training in climate change and become climate leaders. And it's especially um, heartening to hear how people have led these actions in their own institutions. Next slide. Next slide is up, Markley. Uh, no, I mean the next slide. I did that one. I'm not seeing it. Okay. So, who can we communicate with? And who can we educate? And how can we educate them? Well, my own view is that someday climate change will be part of what physicians do in their daily actions. It will be part of what you speak to your patients out about as it is similar to speaking about smoking and um, exercising and being healthy. And the wonderful thing that's going on now is that more and more medical schools and residency training programs are incorporating climate change and health into the work they're doing. And I will um, put in a plug here for G GCCAG, which is the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, as they have a number of great um, presentations going on just almost constantly about this topic. So we need to be able to communicate to our patients, our students, but also our family members, our network, and our communities. And in some ways I would say that we need to get climate change out of the closet because a lot of times there are regional and local um, 
nuances that make people afraid to talk about it. So it's got to be a topic that we're open to discussing. Also, this is fabulous that we're doing this today via Zoom because conferences are a huge, huge way that we put carbon dioxide into the air. And that air travel is huge. And there's a nice study done by Carl, who you'll hear about later, about how our conferences and travel really can contribute to the process. So I do think the issue of hybrid meetings and maybe if societies start having semi, you know, uh, bi-yearly, wait, not bi-yearly, semi-annual meetings instead of annual meetings, maybe something that needs to happen. Next slide. Um, next, oh, wow. next question. So the next Marco. question is how do we, the next question is how do we become advocates? And my answer is just do it. I actually um, left my full time practice of medicine in 2019 um, to walk. You can do the next slide. And I had gotten to the point where I was um, tired of trying. Next slide, um, Haley. Um, I was tired of trying to get the topic of climate change into physical medicine and rehabilitation courses. Um, I have a background in working in sexuality and everybody wanted me to talk about sex, but people balked at the concept of talking about climate change. So we need to change this now and you need to just, um, just do it. I mean, sometimes in life, you just have to do it. And while we have a balance and we, as um, physicians and academicians and, and therapists, et cetera, we may be biased towards doing research, but there also needs to be a balance, not just research, but also what do we do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, next slide. And I will say that walk I started um, is going to restart in 2024. Um, and. Uh, more will come on that, but I'd had to stop because of uh, COVID. Next slide. So I'm still going from uh, Rocky Mountain to Key West. I've walked from Canada to Rocky Mount thus far, um, really with a goal of describing how inaccessible roads are not only for persons with disabilities, but also able-bodied people. Now I'm gonna segue from the general topic of why we need to be involved in climate change as leaders, educators, and advocates into the issue particularly of disability. And now I've lost my power. Markley, the slide that we're on is not all disabilities are alike. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, not all disabilities are alike. Um, there are some issues, and please tell me if you stop hearing me. There are some issues with disabilities. For instance, if we think about spinal cord injuries, um, my own area of expertise, people with spinal cord injuries, in my opinion, are probably the most impacted by climate change. Why is that? Well, they have poikilothermia. So their temperature changes based on whether it's very hot or very cold. So it is truly, um, it is truly an issue for them if they're out in the heat. And one of the recommendations is that, um, pretty much all people with spinal cord injuries should have Apple watches. Um, they need that, um, they need that backup. I had a individual tell me once on how he got out of his wheelchair and he, um, he dropped his phone. And so he was powerless because he dropped his phone. Um, so that is an, an important possibility. The next um, comment is 
skin, orthopedic and neurologic issues, um, all these significant issues that people with spinal cord injury have problems with are more substantial than many other um, disabilities potentially people have. Lateral bowel incontinence brings along with it the issue of having um, the need for catheters. The issues of incontinence can be terrible. Um, so all of these issues can impact people with severe, profound neurologic disabilities, not just spinal cord injuries, but people with um, severe. Mark Lee, you just went on mute. Are you still with us? Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Did you miss that whole discussion of bladder and bowel incontinence? So I was just saying how with profound disabilities, um, there can be other um, issues that people need to deal with. And so in this case, there are many medical aspects that people may also have to deal with in terms of disability. There are definitely social aspects and human rights aspects, but there become issues. Depending on the degree of persons with disabilities have. Please go to next slide, Haley. The other issue is that there are people with sensory disorders, um, people with, with, with blindness, people with hearing impairment. Haley, next slide. Can you guys still hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, good. I apologize. My screen keeps going in and out. So people with sensory disorders or chronic medical diseases also have special needs. They have difficulty of awareness of disasters. If you cannot see, it's more difficult to read things. I mean, there's so much setup that people need in terms of alternative text and being able to hear that, which also requires power. Um, people have problems being in cramped shelters. Um, if you've got people with autism, for instance, that cannot be close to someone or brain injuries, problems being in shelters. Um, devices require electrical power. What if you're on a ventilator? People can say, oh, get a generator, but generators have a tremendous problem in that they, are, they make the air around people terrible. And then you also need gas, and it's difficult to find gas in a storm. The need for medication, supplies, caregivers. Um, caregivers sometimes are not allowed to go to shelters. The need for transportation when you can't just be in regular transport and you're trying to evacuate can be an issue. And then people have individual needs. And in session three of our series, we're actually gonna hear from Gretchen Dillon, who is um, the woman that it looks like her picture came out sideways, but she's a woman living with a spinal cord injury in Puerto Rico and actually has gone through, first she went through Maria, and now five years later, she went through the last storm. And the last thing I heard from her was she was having to drink her pool water. So a lot of these issues um, are out there and we don't hear about them. The other, next slide, please. The, the other issue is that we don't live in a vacuum. A person with a disability often has other concerns that can make them have greater um, susceptibility in areas of disaster, such as being poor, living in a vulnerable area, um, which may increase the possibility for migration, extreme temperatures, having potential dual diagnoses, and then new pathogens will cause new sources of infections and exacerbate morbidity. Next slide. Healthcare is um, something we all have in common. 
And the reality is when we look at the professionals that have been involved in healthcare, in climate change, and in climate change and health is um, the preponderance has been people involved in acute care. Um, there are a lot of emergency room doctors interested in the topic, pediatricians, psychiatrists, other specialties, and rehabilitation professionals have been slow to the game. So we've got to get involved and we need to start also thinking about what our own practices are contributing um, to the issue of climate change mitigation. Yes, we've got to work on adaptation for our patient population, but we've also got to think about what we do and how much carbon we're putting into the environment. My own belief, next slide, is that joining in community is the solution. We've got to join in community, community We've got to join, next slide, with other rehabilitation professionals, other healthcare professionals, with people with the lived experience of disabilities to bring these issues to light. And fortunately, we've been able to develop a position statement through the Association of Academic Physiatrists in the US, and one will be coming out hopefully soon with the International Society of PM&R. I'm, I'm a little long on my talk, and I apologize. I think the um, weather's been making it more difficult, but I've only got about three more slides, which I'll go through quickly. Can you go to the next slide? Um, we should be on the slide that says international research now. Yep, we're there. Great. So the final letter in clear is research. And the area of research in disability and climate change is in its infancy. And my own belief and recommendation is that we've got to do international research. We've got to collaborate. This is not a competition. This is a collaboration and teamwork is, um, should all be um, capitalized. People with different disabilities have different risks. People in different climates have different risks. And we've got to study specific solutions for specific populations. There, next slide. There are many things we can research, um, communicating, waste audits, using less labs, um, biodegradable supply, telemedicine, tracking devices, being home, more holistic in our care, and developing new systems for cooling for people with special needs. Next slide. Transitioning to plant-based diets, tooling medical education, increasing our own personal activities, such as people saying they were taking the train instead of um, getting to work via car, um, thinking about global and regional impacts of climate change, and, um, and really how to ensure that greener healthcare and a greener environment can be good for everyone. And one of the things that I mentioned before is my walk, and my walk now is changing as I've, as I've grown and my life has changed, and what it's going to be called now is the green route, aiding healthy adaptation and mitigation which I think is what we've all got to start um, thinking about. Final slide. Um, in summary, we are so happy to have you as part of this um, course. We really encourage you to participate in all of the lectures. You can see there are profound issues when we talk about climate change, rehabilitation, and disability. People's needs are different. Um, their function is different and they um, have different comorbidities. People with disabilities are ignored. They're different than just working on, for instance, the city of, uh, uh, I don't know, the city of uh, Phoenix, because people with disabilities don't live in groups. And they also have medical and multiple concerns. 
Um, I seem to have lost this final slide, but I'm just going to say this before I get done, and hopefully other people can emphasize this. What we would like with this course is um, that you all think as part of this course about one step you can make to work on climate change. Um, you know, think about getting a measurable goal and give yourself the time to do this and also give yourself a timeline. So what one thing can you do in 2022 to start working on the issue of climate change and rehabilitation and disability? And with that, I'll turn to Cecilia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander, for calling in during a hurricane uh, to give this talk. It, it's so inspirational uh, to hear about the work that you're doing. So I'm gonna just share my slides here really quickly and bear with me here. Okay. So I am gonna give a little bit of a background and a framing on the issues related to climate and health in 2022. You know, there's been incredible research that's been going on over the past several decades. We're learning new things every day. And so what I want to do is just sort of bring the group up to speed on the most recent findings in the IPCC report, which is an intergovernmental report that's published roughly every four years to six years and has special issues which come out frequently. So as many of you know, and probably one of the reasons you came to this workshop is that climate change and the impacts on health are widespread, they're rapid, and they're intensifying. And recently, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called climate change a code red for humanity. And I think that rhetoric and that language is really important because a code red is, is a medical emergency, right? He's not saying, you know, this is an emergency for polar bears, this is an emergency for humans. And that is why we are here today. And so we can be thinking about, you know, climate change as being one of the greatest global health threats of the 21st century, but we can also be thinking about climate change as being one of the greatest opportunities. Because as we'll talk more about in this workshop, the more we, we seek to address climate change, the more we improve environmental health, we improve all sorts of outcomes, and we improve health equity. So this is a figure that I think really nicely summarizes uh, the, the impacts we're seeing right now um, from climate change really across the globe. And this is a figure from the IPCC AR6 report. And what we are seeing here is that the darker the circle is, the more evidence or confidence we have that these impacts are occurring. So what we are seeing is that there are widespread impacts really across the globe on water security and food production. We're seeing documented impacts on infectious diseases, on heat, on malnutrition, on mental health, on forced displacement. And of course, as you know, we're seeing impacts on cities, settlements, and infrastructure, um, including in Markley's hometown, um, as well as among health systems, hospitals, and other really essential features of our societies, which support um, healthy living. Another, I think, key finding of the most recent IPCC report is that they looked at 11 categories of diseases and health outcomes, which together compromise set comprise 70% of global mortality. And they found that all of these are climate sensitive, meaning that their prevalence, their frequency, and their distribution is gonna be changing as a result of climatic variables. And so what we can see here is that diseases and illnesses such as malaria, dengue, respiratory tract infections, non-communicable diseases, cardiovascular diseases are all climate sensitive. And this is really important because this tells us as health professionals or even as, as just people walking on this planet that our health is being affected on a daily basis because of the environment that we are living in. So I have a Zoom poll question for you, Haley, if you wanna deploy it. And the question is, what health issues are you concerned may be made worse by climate change in the region where you are? If you were to sort of say, what is the most important health outcome that, that you're either seeing in your practice or in your community that you think is of is a really high concern. And I think it's really variable depending on what part of the world you're in, right? I think that's one of the key features of climate change is that impacts vary geographically and they also vary by uh, underlying community composition.
Okay, we're gonna give it another 15, 20 seconds here. Great. Thanks everyone for your feedback. Haley, you wanna show us the results? Okay, so seeing a lot of people thinking about heat exposure, thinking about vector-borne disease, and of course, mental illness is way up there, absolutely. And of course, gastrointestinal diseases, cardiovascular diseases, we're seeing a lot of impact. So thank you all so much for your input. And as I mentioned, you know, it's gonna depend on where you are and what your community looks like. That's really gonna determine what the main health impacts are that you're gonna be seeing in practice. I think that this next slide is a really useful schematic. This is taken from the Lancet Countdown, where it's really, I, I see kind of a blueprint or a map to think about how climate pressures, which are those variables that are changing because of climate change, ultimately result in health outcomes. So what we're seeing globally is increased temperatures, more extreme weather, rising sea levels, extremes of precipitation, which result in exposure pathways, those things most proximal to health. And that includes heat waves, air pollution, water contamination, changes in vector ecology, increasing allergens, effects on food supply and quality, as well as population displacement. And then ultimately, that is impacting health outcomes, right, across wide spectrums, including, you know, uh, 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 sorry, uh, pregnancy-related outcomes, um, trauma, gastrointestinal illnesses, and so on and so forth. So I just want to give a couple examples of this um, from the literature. So this is, uh, I think, a really useful map from NOAA, where we're looking at 2021 and a map of uh, billion-dollar weather and climate-related disasters, just to sort of put this in perspective. And this is a, a data collection that is produced by NOAA, which is the US National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And what we're seeing here is that each of these disasters resulted in over a billion dollars of damage. And if we think about this and what that ends up doing to our, our society, and this is not even accounting for health impacts, is that we are going into climate debt, right? We are having damages to infrastructure, damages to buildings, damages to our built environment that we really are going to be unable to pay for as time goes on. And what we're seeing here in this bar graph is this increasing risk of disasters over time. And many of these are climate related, including severe storms, droughts, wildfires, and et cetera. There's really great evidence that you can find um, on the impacts of climate change from the Lancet countdown. Um, some data I'll share with you here is that as it relates to vector borne diseases, what we're seeing is that unusually high periods of rainfall and altered humidity and warmer temperatures are modifying the geographic distribution and densities of Anopheles mosquitoes, which uh, carry malaria. And so we're seeing that rates of malaria, intensities of malaria are increasing in many parts of the world where it is endemic and spreading to places where it formerly was not endemic. The same thing can be said for any diseases that are transmitted by Aedes aegypti or Aedes allopictus mosquitoes. That includes, includes dengue, includes chikungunya and Zika. Again, we're seeing that these mosquitoes are better able to replicate and survive in environments that are being impacted by climate change, which is resulting in higher impacts um, to those populations. We also know that climate change is linked to air pollution, right? They have a similar sort of common um, origin, which is the burning of, of fossil fuels. And so there's been emerging data that areas of the world that have worse chronic air pollution, people who live there are at higher risk of mortality from COVID-19. And so here we're seeing really how climate change is sort of this threat multiplier, right? It's taking a global pandemic and it's making it worse for individuals who live in those areas affected by air pollution. And last but not least, just sort of looking again at global data, um, we're seeing that climate change is driving unprecedented numbers of forced displacement. So this is from the International Displacement Monitoring Center. And in 2020 alone, there were 40 million new displacements. And of those, 30 million were due to disasters. And if we look at that breakdown, these are, are weather-related or climate-influenced disasters, including droughts, extreme temperatures, landslides from heavy flooding, um, wildfires, floods, et cetera. And so this is a problem that is continuing to grow. The numbers look very similar for 2021, where we're seeing tons of people forced to migrate because the environmental conditions where they're living are becoming inhospitable. I think other key findings from the IPCC 
um, which we know are that, of course, climate change affects everyone and no one is immune to impacts, but we know that the most devastating are occurring and will continue to impact people and places who are economically and socially marginalized. And so our best science is telling us that climate change is really worsening health inequities and creating incredibly, incredibly strong headwinds against progress towards our sustainable development goals. So new research from the World Bank Group shows that up to 132 million people will be pushed into extreme poverty by 2023. And in the U.S., we know that nearly two-thirds of the morbidity costs of climate change are currently being shouldered by our Medicare and Medicaid patients. So, you know, there's a lot of really dark news here, and uh, we're here today to kind of bring light to this news and to think about how we can act and how we can change these outcomes. And I would say, you know, this this statistic from the IPC is probably the most important thing that they say, which is that the severity of climate-related health risks is highly dependent on how well health systems can protect people. And we are health systems, right? So I was just looking at CNN today, and here we're seeing in Florida where Hurricane Ian is forcing Florida hospitals to close and to transfer patients, right? And oftentimes what we see is that health systems are highly impacted by climate-driven disasters. And when hospitals shut down, people lack access to care, right? So we need to be able to strengthen our health systems to be able to continue to provide care during these climate related events, which are gonna happen throughout our century. And additionally, we need to be thinking about how we build resilient as well as low carbon health systems. So this is data from Healthcare Without Harm. And they found that if you were to take all the health systems globally and bundle them together, that together they would be the fifth largest emitter of greenhouse gases on the planet in rankings by country. And so in addition to doing an incredible amount of good that we do, there's also some inherent harm. There's some externalities to the care that we provide. But again, that's not an inevitability. So some studies have shown that energy intensity ranges by a factor of 10 for comparable health systems. So we have choices, right? We don't have to continue to provide um, health services the way that we do. We can work towards decarbonizing them. And there's really a very important reason to do this. So we're kind of stuck in this non-virtuous cycle. So in 2018, we know that air pollution emissions from healthcare resulted in the loss of nearly 400,000 disability adjusted life years in the US alone and added to over $6 million in direct health costs and over $5 billion in indirect health costs, right? So we see in this circle that, you know, healthcare services result in climate change and environmental degradation, which then leads to poor health, which then leads to people needing more healthcare services. And we're sort of caught in this, in this non-virtuous cycle that we need to be using our voices as health professionals to be able to find solutions for. The thing I'd like to end on here is that, you know, Climate solutions, which improve uh, our health and also improve our economies and make job opportunities are really win-win actions. And so we have this ability as health professionals to send this message to policymakers, to our patients, to our communities, so that we make the best possible choices. And so why, why focus on health professionals? I just pulled this data from the World Health Organization. So globally, we are a workforce of almost 50 million people. And in a recent large multinational survey of health professionals, actually most health professionals feel that climate change is already affecting the commu their communities where they work across a broad range of categories, and they feel a responsibility to act, yet one of the greatest barriers to this is their own feeling of, uh, of expertise and of knowledge and of empowerment. So I think this is, you know, one way to kind of think about this as your role as a health professional, you are many things. You are a clinician, maybe you're a researcher, you're also a trusted community voice. People ask you about all kinds of things and they really value your opinion. You may be an institutional leader or you might be a private citizen, but in all of these different roles that you play, you have, uh, you have agency to act. So I want to end with this slide. I saw it recently and it's basically the notion that the, the Chinese characters for the word crisis um, are, are danger and opportunity. And so I think, you know, in this situation we're in, yes, there is danger, but there's also is opportunity and there's choice. And so, you know, one of the goals of this workshop is to really help empower you to make choices which are going to improve the health of your patients and going to improve the health of your communities and your families. So I will 
stop there and I'm going to turn it over to Carl. Thank you so much. Hi, Jesse. Thank you very much for that interesting and empowering talk. Hi, everyone. Uh, please allow me to share my screen first. Okay. Hi, everyone. Again, please allow me uh, to greet you a pleasant morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are joining us from. Thank you very much for dedicating some of your time to join this course. I'm Dr. Leo Chico, and I'm originally from the Philippines and uh, currently in Canada for further training on brain medicine, uh, which is related to the topic I'm going to focus on in relation to climate change. I would like us to begin with a statement from the WHO Global Report on Health equity for persons with disabilities. It states, disability is part of being human and integral to the human experience. And if we are going to be honest, we will realize that at some point in our life, almost every one of us will temporarily or permanently experience disability, whether seen or unseen. And probably most of us already know somebody aside from our patients, with some form of disability, whether they are among our immediate or extended families, friends, or people we care about. Currently, 1 billion people, or 15% of the world's population, have a disability, which is even higher in prevalence in resource-limited countries like the Philippines, where I am originally from. But every country, regardless of resources, is vulnerable to health emergencies. And we know health emergencies have significant consequences on public health, well-being, and health development. And among the health emergencies, we have the effects of climate change. And we have heard of more severe and prolonged heat waves, widespread and more frequent wildfires, extreme rainfall and fatal flash floods, uh, severe and prolonged droughts, increased deforestation, and extreme tropical cyclones. And just very recently in the Philippines, we have heard of one of the fastest 24-hour intensification rates on record for any tropical cyclone. Noru, also known as Carding, locally, transformed from a tr tropical storm to an equivalent of a category five hurricane when the peak winds rapidly increased from about 60 to 160 miles per hour in just 24 hours. And uh, I could just imagine the fear of my countrymen, my family included, as they waited for its landfall since the rapid transformation of the hurricane left them with little time and resources to prepare for a potentially huge devastation, not just to properties, but also infrastructure, crops, livelihood, and most importantly, the lives of people. And scientists say human caused climate change is increasing the potential for such rapid strengthening. Fortunately, there is Sierra Madre, which is the longest mountain range in the north eastern portion of our country. And through so many years, it remains to be our greatest hope at surviving the country's many natural disasters. It spans about 10 regions or 10 provinces, three regions, and protects almost 50 million people in the region, covering almost 1.4 million hectares, which is home to the country's most biodiverse forests, Sierra Madre is uh, undoubtedly irreplaceable. Without it, the hurricane Noru would have caused greater damage to our land and to our people. And we are really grateful for it. Unfortunately though, human activity has always been the greatest threat to our planet. And our natural barrier against typhoons, including Sierra Madre is no exception. Illegal and legal mining deforestation and construction on the land are slowly chipping away at Sierra Madre. Unchecked 
illegal logging remains the main culprit of deforestation. And indeed, the government has to act on this before it's too late. We all know that there are devastating consequences of health emergencies brought about by climate change. And these consequences continue to aggravate pre-existing health inequities, especially for groups that are disproportionately impacted, like those living with disabilities, children, and our families. Uh, these groups are significantly affected, not just by climate crisis, but they're even more disproportionately impacted by accompanying social and economic inequalities that arise from climate crisis. All right, uh, before we talk about the effects of climate crisis on these groups that are disproportionately impacted, let's have a poll question. So is this statement true or false? In disaster preparation and or response, we primarily consider the disease of each patient. So do you consider that statement true or false? So I'll give you a few seconds to, uh, to vote. All right, Haley, do we have a summary of results? Okay, good. Um, majority answered false. That's what I was actually aiming for because in my opinion, I consider this statement as false because uh, what I would like to highlight is the importance of moving from disease specific context to disability specific context when we are handling patients before, during or after a disaster. Uh, regardless of the medical diagnosis, what matters is the ability of the individual. And uh, we need to consider what each person can do or cannot do. And one way to do this is to actually be familiar with each person's cognitive, sensory, motor, speech, and even psychosocial disability. Now, talking about the groups that are disproportionately impacted, one large group consists of patients with disabilities arising from neuro neurologic diseases, and there are a lot of them, ranging from developmental disorders like ADHD to vascular diseases like stroke and uh, acquired brain injuries like TBI. But regardless of the medical diagnosis, we look more at the ensuing impairments and functional limitations when dealing with health emergencies. For instance, uh, let's consider patients who have sensory impairments like problems in vision and or hearing. These patients may be unable to recognize danger or hear or read about instructions regarding evacuation, which can put them at high risk for danger. Another example is uh, the group of patients with cognitive impairments. Persons with ADHD, for instance, may have difficulties in executive functioning, communication, and social interaction. And thus, these patients can better understand instructions about evacuation or safety precautions when they are written in simple language. So it would be better if we have instructions in short sentences using simple words that can describe one action at a time and uh, provide basic, easy to understand information. And such people also are emotionally impressionable. And so it is important that people leading in an evacuation, for instance, maintain a calm and a soft-spoken demeanor. And uh, if we're going to specifically consider patients with TBI, we know that they have difficulty or they may have difficulty reading and processing large amounts of information. So these patients would appreciate information presented in brief bullet points, for instance, with spaces in between. Uh, TBI patients may also report headaches and nausea or sometimes get agitated when surrounded by noise and pollution. Hence, 
they might find it difficult to stay in a crowded shelter or evacuation center. They may even struggle with regulation of body temperature. Uh, when windows must be closed, for instance, patients without air conditioning may have to deal with worsening confusion or disorientation. Uh, some patients may even result in dehydration and electrolyte disturbances leading to headaches and sometimes seizures. So that kind of situ situation can be tricky uh, for these patients. Cognitive impairments may also impede one's ability to take self-protective actions. For instance, those who lack insight into their deficits often do not appreciate their need for assistance from others, and uh, that would be difficult in the event of a hurricane. Similarly, persons with impaired judgment may fail to respond in a timely manner to, warn to warnings in order to commence preparedness uh, or preparedness activities or to evacuate from high risk areas. Similarly, those with poor executive functioning like planning and problem solving skills often have difficulty troubleshooting when routines are disrupted and the unexpected occurs such as in cases of power outages or flash floods or they may have difficulties planning and sequencing the steps required to adequately prepare for a disaster. And um, we also have individuals with impaired memory from whatever neurologic disease, uh, for instance, from a vascular or a neurodegenerative disease. And these patients are more likely to forget to purchase or replenish essential emergency supplies at home leaving them uh, unready for a disaster. And um, another example would be patients with impaired orientation. Imagine extreme weather events that can cause electrical or power blackouts and hurricane shuttered windows. And the absence of external indicators as to time and place can deprive patients of significant cueing or orienting cues. So their disorientation can be triggered or further aggravated. And also we have here like self-explanatory instances like patients with mobility limitations, uh, needing gate aids or wheelchairs, and uh, they may find it hard to maneuver around clutter and flooded spaces. And uh, last but not the least, persons with neurologic diseases may also have either new onset or aggravated pre-existing mood disorders or coping difficulties. Some may even have symptoms of PTSD or may experience social isolation from disasters. So basically, these are just few instances, and I'm sure you can think of more, that show how persons with lived experiences of disability caused by neurologic diseases may be affected during health emergencies related to climate change. Um, like patients with dysphagia needing electric pump for tube feedings or those depending on intrathecal baclofen uh, for spasticity. And overall, it seems that these patients may result in difficulty in one or more of the steps in the emergency management cycle from mitigation, preparedness, response, and recovery. And this is my last slide, or second to the last slide. Uh, fortunately, through the years, people are now more cognizant to the abilities of persons with lived experiences of disability. We now look past the disability of people, but rather look at their abilities. We may even re recognize that these people can either be or already are experts in resilience and innovation. They constantly try to find solutions or innovate so they can survive and even thrive in this world. However, this is not enough. We need to give them support and opportunities to do these things. And it is vital that we involve them and get their inputs when planning about strategies to address climate change because their lived experiences can better inform our policies and infrastructures. And so with that, I end my presentation here, 
hoping that together we can build a better and safe world with a heart. Thank you very much for your kind attention. And uh, now I'm going to uh, give the floor to my fellow speaker, Maya Newman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Crown. Thank you to all the other panelists. This has been really wonderful so far. And thank you for everybody participating um, in the chat. Um, now I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, um, as we've kind of alluded to already, that all people are affected by environmental hazards. Um, there are certain people who um, are at more disadvantage, people who are poor, elderly, children, and persons with lived experience of, dis of disability, they're all more disproportionately impacted. Um, so we've given some examples how persons with functional impairments or health limitations, they're less likely to have supplies, an evacuation plan, or engage in emergency trainings compared to the general population. Today, um, as a pediatric rehabilitation physician, I'm going to talk a little bit about children and how, why they're um, particularly those with special health care needs and why they have unique challenges related to disaster scenarios. Okay, so um, there are about 200 million children worldwide who experience some form of disability. And in the US alone, there are around 11 million children with special health care needs. So I'm going to be referring to children with special health care needs as um, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau defines it as an increased risk of developing chronic physical, developmental, behavioral, or emotional conditions that may require health related services beyond those expected of typical or neurotypical children. Um, about 50% of children with special health care needs require at least five or more health care services um, or specialized medical equipment. So um, here's a poll question for everyone. Um, in what ways are children with special health care needs at increased risk during a natural disaster? Children can become separated from their caregivers. They often have difficulty communicating due to fear, developmental immaturity, or cognitive limitations. And they may require electrical devices for life support or maintenance, or all of the above. Okay, Haley. Okay, good. Um, so basically everyone is right. It is all of the above. So even if you just answered one of them, um, they're all correct. And we're gonna go into this a little bit more. Okay, so I'm gonna try to highlight this through a case um, of a typical child that I might see in my practice. Okay, so Raphael is a five-year-old boy with developmental delay, dysphagia, epilepsy, and spastic quadriplegic cerebral palsy, who is functionally dependent on his caregiver, who is his grandmother, to coordinate and perform all of his mobility, transfers, and activities of daily living. Now, I know there's a bunch of jargon in there. So I'm going to quickly try to um, define some of these things because it will help you all um, interact with me as I'm asking you questions. So for those who um, are not as familiar, uh, cerebral palsy is a, um, an umbrella term used to describe children with some who've experienced some sort of brain injury, whether 
um, in utero during the time of delivery or within the first two years of their life when their brain is most actively developing. And they also have a resulting functional motor impairment. Spasticity is a form of high muscle tone or stiffness of the muscles, and it can interfere with movement, speech, and also be associated with discomfort or pain. Um, epilepsy is someone who um, has seizures. Um, and let's see, um, developmental delay is, the, is a child who is not meeting their gross motor, their fine motor, or the cognitive linguistic milestones as compared to neurotypical children at their same age. Dysphagia is someone who has difficulty swallowing. Um, and then when we talk about activities of daily living, that's a healthcare term that's used to describe um, people's daily self-care activities. So bathing, dressing, feeding themselves, brushing their teeth, toileting, et cetera. So hopefully that explains most of these terms so we can go on. Okay, so um, if you can please put in the chat, um, what are some of the healthcare challenges that Raphael may face? Um, and just to prompt you, some of those terms we talked about, so spast having spasticity, cerebral palsy, epilepsy, developmental delay, dysphagia, these activities, what are some of the things that might be um, just in general, not, not related yet to climate change, just in general? And um, if you don't mind, uh, Cecilia or Haley, if you could read them to me as people type them. Yeah, transport to health provider, self-care, again, transport issues. Maybe we'll give a little more time. <laughs> transport issues for sure. Definitely. Absolutely. Okay. I can go on, should I? Oh, and there's more ability to take meds, communication. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Okay. Eating, proper nutrition, again, communication may require electricity for equipment and meds, communication, activities of daily living. Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Bathing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All of these, they're dependent. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit more background for Raphael in particular. So he is able to move all of his extremities, meaning his arms and his legs. He has more control of his upper extremities, his arms compared to his legs, but he can't he coordinate it very well. Um, he has a lot of tightness in his legs, especially with his hip abductor. So he keeps his legs more tightly together. So um, that can affect um, changing in bowel and bladder and diapers. Um, he's nonverbal, but he can, he does have some signs and he can point to things which his family understands. Um, he cries, he makes eye contact. He does some guttural noises for his communication. He has a G tube and here's a little picture of what that means. Um, getting nutrition, water, medications through a device that goes into your, um, stomach. Um, to deliver it to your body. He's diapered, um, so not toilet trained. And some of the medications he takes, her baclofen, um, that's for his high muscle tone. Um, Keppra, that is for his um, seizure disorder. Miralax um, and the as needed suppository are because he has a, um, constipation and to help keep him regular. Um, for his nutrition, he gets tube feedings um, and water five times a day through his G-tube because um, he cannot feed himself and he has dysphagia difficulty swallowing, so he um, cannot take um, anything by mouth. And um, all of his medications also go through the G-tube. Um, he uses an adaptive stroller, so almost like a wheelchair, but um, he doesn't need to use the wheelchair because he cannot control it himself. And a lot of times it's easier for caregivers to be able to fold up the stroller and it's a little bit lighter um, than a wheelchair. Um, he has a bath chair to make it safer and easier for him when he is bathing so he can be strapped in. Um, and he uses bilateral ankle foot or thrust or orthoses, which you can see here, that helps um, keep his um, 
keep his ankles stretched out with his high muscle tone and also keeps them able to be positioned so that he can fit into his strollers or into shoes. Um, and um, he, okay, so he lives in a first level apartment with his grandmother and his nine-year-old sister. And um, I have them in Southwest Florida. Um, that he attends developmental preschool every day. And this during this time is when his grandmother is able to work at a local grocery store. Okay, so now we are giving kind of a, a real life example, but um, it's late August, or we can say late September, and it's hurricane season. Raphael is at school and his grandmother is at work and the wind is blowing, the rain is pouring down. So now we're getting into a natural disaster. What are some factors that put Raphael at risk if, it, if this disaster actually strikes? You can write in the chat. And again, um, Cecilia, if you don't mind reading, if anybody types anything. Sure. Uh, proper nutrition. Uh, oh, sorry. No, the power outages. Barbara says power outages. Flooding. Yeah. Flooding. Separation from grandmother. It's a great okay. point. Yep. Communication. Loss of power. Yes, exactly. All of those things. So definitely separation from his primary caregiver. He is reliant on um, daily anti-seizure and hypertonia medications that cannot be missed. These are medications that you have to take daily and you can have um, lots of symptoms of withdrawal or a seizure in this case. Um, if you don't take them, he relies on um, external help and um, formula to give him nutrition. He relies on others for any kind of transportation, even transfers. Um, he can't communicate his needs clearly to people that are not cares caregivers. Um, he, um, he has really expensive equipment that he needs and um, getting lost or separated from them. He's dependent for his bowel and bladder and he requires diapering. Um, his, he has a sister who's a minor and she also depends relies on the grandmother for basic needs. So um, all of these are gonna be come into effect for, for causing stressors. Okay, um, so what factors would help Raphael and his grandmother during this situation? Um, I'm giving you some, some clues, some preparation things. Yes. You can put in the chat now, what factors would help Raphael and his grandmother during the situation? Uh, okay, here we go. David, travel packed with basic supplies, having a generator, solar or battery operated equipment, having a plan. Perfect, mm -hmm. good job. Yeah, so having some sort of emergency kit, preparedness kit, um, having a disaster plan written, typed, that's on, that's very close to Raphael, so maybe in his bag, it's, maybe it's taped to his wheelchair, um, um, you, it, which explains the plan, explains who his backup caretakers are, It um, uh, there's some kind of document that talks that tells them what his diagnosis is what his medications are as if he has allergies there's a list of phone numbers and contacts including family physicians where the nearest hospital is because if he's separated for whatever reason even from his daycare people won't know how to care for him um they it would also be good in the in a preparedness kit to have um extra week of supplies essential medications his formula, diapers, changes of clothes, et cetera. So good job. Okay, so here we go. The hurricane hits, Raphael's at school and they don't have any power. It's not safe for his grandmother to reach him. He's really scared. He's breathing quickly. He's crying. He doesn't know what is happening. Um, his grandmother luckily prepared an emergency document 
with his diagnosis, medications, and a contact list at the beginning of the school year. So the school nurse is able to reach a neighbor who can then reach the grandmother um, to say that they're, they have a supply of four days of medications, they have formula, diapers, and they have some bottled water to help to get, be able to give him free water. Um, although he normally gets his um, tube feedings um, through um, electrical um, de powered um, device to give him his medications and his formula and his water through his G-tube. The school nurf, nurse is also able to manually give it to him. Um, it's just going to take extra time, but she will have a way to give him um, all of his needs. So, and this is a, this is the, a great case scenario, right? You can imagine how this could go in so many different ways. Okay, so um, just some wrap up things. So children with special health care needs have unique challenges related to disaster scenarios, as we've talked about. Um, they depend on caregivers, medical personnel, and equipment to support their mobility and their activities of daily living. Um, if they're separated from people that know how to care for them and the tools, they're at huge risk um, and there's a threat to their lives. Um, they can have difficulty communicating and they can have cognitive impairments, limit, limitations. Um, if there's prolonged electrical power failures, access to clean water or interruptions in medications, they can be seriously jeopardized. So we talked about a, a good case scenario, but think about um, even in a resource rich area that can be, they can jeopardize, but imagine if you're in a strange or underdeveloped or a rural system in the US or throughout the world and they don't have enough resources, equipment, personnel, medical experts to care for these people, for these children. Um, efforts to rescue children with special health care needs during a disaster can be demanding for the community and the emergency responders because even taking care of the general population is already um, a ton of work. So disaster planning for everyone, but particularly caring for the, those who are caring for children with special health care needs is essential. And um, as healthcare providers, we can help give them reminders and lists, simple lists that um, can help them prepare to, to make it even a little bit easier during such a situation. Um, so thank you so much. That's the end of my talk for now, but please put questions in the Q&A area and we'll have more of a discussion at the end. Thanks. Thank you so much, Maya, Carl, and Mark Lee for these fantastic perspectives on, on these issues. We have a couple of questions so far in the Q&A and in the chat. If anybody has any questions or comments or items for discussion, please let us know. Uh, the first question we had uh, was, how could we as a community intervene quickly to the rescue of physically impaired members of our community to reduce the level of cognitive impact when disasters occur? Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, George, for that interesting question. Um, well, just to relate to my talk earlier, uh, cognitive impairments uh, can affect a person's overall health, well-being, safety, even problem solving and functionality before, during, or after a disaster. And uh, we can just imagine the anxiety and apprehension accompanying severe storm warnings, especially when they're so rapid, like the one I explained in my talk earlier, uh, Typhoon Noru, uh, which uh, escalated in terms of uh, its speed and intensity in just 24 hours. And the anxiety and apprehension may also compromise uh, their capacity to take effective action. And so by then it might be too late. So this carries important implications for prioritizing and tailoring disaster preparedness plans for this population, specifically persons with lived experiences of disability, whether physical, neurologic, psychologic, or a combination of these. So, as a community, I think there are a lot of ways we can do this together. One is uh, we can probably conduct awareness campaigns or online meetings such as this one we're having. So we can, proper, we can properly bring adequate and useful knowledge to our stakeholders 
and their families. Uh, another way could also be organizing campaigns uh, that involve persons with lived experiences because they can share their lived experiences with us and the, these can actually be even more impactful to our uh, audience and uh, to the grassroots level. And another way is uh, as a community, we can also be creative also by creating educational resources or flyers, infographics, and disseminate them to families with children with special healthcare needs or other persons with lived experiences. And uh, just to reiterate, please remember the tips or the points to consider I mentioned earlier in my talk to make information user-friendly and uh, easy to understand. Yeah, and that's perfect. Just to add to that, um, uh, anybody, whether you're um, in healthcare profession or not, um, can create can make little lists to get people prepared. Because sometimes when you're stressed and you don't, um, it's hard to think about and coordinate what you want to do, whether or not um, you have any kind of functional or cognitive or sensory impairments, it's good to have reminders of what to do. And I know that like, for example, if you think about the airline industry, they they have had a lot of changes in there over the last 50 years about how they conduct what to do in emergency and that saved a lot of people. So similarly, if we make lists about um, what we need and we prepare our disaster kits, we will be helping um, each other. And sometimes um, there's really easy tools to go out um, and look those up what you need. And I think that providers, it would be great if in your, offer, in your offices, you had those to hand out. And if you can just briefly ask questions like, hey, you know, there could, this is these type of disasters could occur in our community. These are the things that we prefer. Here's a little list. And next time we'll check in and see if you've prepared for that. And if you need help, let me know. Thank you, Carl. Maya, those are, those are great suggestions. Um, one comment here from Elaine is that if the USA is going to be into climate debt, the less rich countries in the Caribbean and the Americas and probably elsewhere are likely going to really suffer after climate disasters. No. <laughs> Wondering if, uh, Carl, maybe you have any perspective on that from your links to the Philippines and sort of how you see this issue. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Ceci. And uh, thank you, Elaine, for that comment. Uh, really, what we can see is that even if uh, you take a city like uh, Manila, for instance. When floods happen in the city, it's the poor that are the most implicated or impacted. And uh, having grown up in a country like the Philippines, I'm witness to the inequalities in the society. Uh, and this is essentially what it comes down to, right? Uh, the world is very unequal, unfortunately, and it's playing it out in terms of climate change as well. But that inequality, however, is also found within rich countries. Uh, there are people in even rich countries or developed countries um, who may be, who may have limited resources, who may have less money to spend on air conditioning, for instance, to adapt to heat waves or flood insurance to rebuild after storms. So um, I think uh, it's not just the resource limited countries, right? But uh, everyone is impacted around the world. Thanks so much, Carl. Um, a question here from Gloria. As a natural resource researcher, I might not always be in the spaces where important decisions are being made by health and disaster preparedness professionals. Any advice on how to get more involved in those spaces? Um, Cecilia, oh, yeah. do you do you think you could help us with that, Cecilia? Because I think you're you're really awesome at getting involved. No, I, I think that's that's a really, really good point, Gloria. And uh, you know, I think there's many different levels of engagement that can occur. You know, I always say, you know, start start hyper local, right? Um, who is in charge of disaster preparedness at whatever health system you work at? Um, if you're a researcher, you know, there's maybe, is there an affiliated hospital, university hospital, or even local community hospital? And reaching out there could be a place. Another 
uh, spot I would recommend is thinking about any patient advocacy groups that are already doing this work and offering to sort of lend your expertise as a researcher. I think that's also very impactful. I think it's very good also to think about how societies can work together. So whatever society you might belong to and how they can put out position statements on this. Um, Mark Lee is now back from the hurricane. Mark Lee, do you have any advice on this? Maybe not. Okay. But Gloria, I think that's a really great point. And you know, one of the things that we really are trying to do is, is bring health professionals together to think how we can, you know, organize our voice and amplify it so that we are able to sort of bring this, these, these health perspectives to improve disaster uh, preparedness and, and risk mitigation. So I think that's an excellent point. There's so many ways we can do this. Um, but I always feel like the most effective way is really getting involved locally and figuring out what's going on there. Well, so just, we have, sorry, I just wanted to add to that, that you don't be afraid that you need to reinvent the wheel if you don't know what to say or resources. That's why um, organizations like the Global Consortium are so helpful because they can help provide tools, um, slides, educational resources to help you as long as you're willing to go out there and talk about it. Thanks, Maya. So we and are just slide. wrapping up. Okay. Oh. Sorry, Ceci. Go ahead. All right, I'm sorry. Um, that was an interesting point. Um, and uh, I would just like to add, as healthcare providers, we wear different hats, right? We can be practicing as either clinicians, educators, researchers, administrators, or social mobilizers. And we can leverage any one or more of these roles in advocating for actions to address climate change. For instance, in my capacity, I try to incorporate climate change in my personal research agenda. And I also even use my social media to share links to certain articles or conferences related to climate change, such as this one we're having. And as part of the Sustain Our Abilities organization, we can also contribute to spreading more awareness on climate change through online conferences. Uh, and uh, I think we can like, uh, maximize where we're at currently and uh, go from there. Thank you. Thanks, Carl. And there is a link in the chat right now where you can access the Sustain Our Abilities website where there is a ton of information on this and there will soon be a link to join the community there. Um, there's also more resources on the Global Consortium on Climate and Health website, which you can also access from the chat. So we are gonna wrap up for today. It was wonderful having you here. Thank you for your participation, for your great comments and all your suggestions. We look forward to seeing you next week at this time. Of a quick note, we are going to be switching the webinar uh, link room just for the next session and you will receive an email about this. So thank you all for being here. This is an incredible community and we continue to grow and learn and go on this journey together. So have a wonderful day and we will talk soon. Take care.